China and ASEAN Foreign Minister meeting. It's a first of its kind for the past couple of years. This is convened outside the regular schedule of ASEAN and official meetings. So why now? Why ASEAN member propose such a meeting at this point of time? Let me start with you, Professor Wang. Well, I think uh, this is uh, like a Chinese philosopher uh, uh, indicates that uh, we should focus on the common ground. That China, ASEAN, no territory dispute, no any historic problem, only with some ASEAN member countries. So we should separate this. At the same time, China and ASEAN focus on stability, peace in the South China Sea. This benefit of all. I think this is a common ground we should uh, highlight. At the same time, uh, this uh, 25 years anniversary of uh, uh, bilateral relations with ASEAN. And then uh, September, we will have a summit. And so this is a special uh, Foreign Minister com Conference is also com uh, prepared for that. China ASEAN, uh, we highlight the importance as the community of mutual common interests and with a common responsibility and common destiny. So this is the signal sent to the world. Professor Hedarian joining us there in Manila. Your thoughts on this? What was the Philippines hoping to achieve through this special meeting? Well, as far as I know, the meeting was initiated by Malaysia around February. And the purpose of this meeting was for ASEAN countries as a whole to communicate to China that what we want to happen in the South China Sea is to de-escalate the disputes and make sure that disputes do not get out of control and do not compromise the overall positive character of ASEAN-China relations. If you talk about trade, of course, China is the number one trading part of ASEAN, and there's hope that in terms of investment in infrastructure, China will play a more important role. But I think it also has to do with the fact that there's a genuine worry among any, many ASEAN countries, particularly Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, Philippines, and Vietnam, that the disputes are uh, reaching a very dangerous stage. And of course, with the Philippines arbitration verdict uh, coming on soon, I think there, there's a sense of urgency that together ASEAN and China should find a peaceful way to manage these disputes. Well, you just laid it out for us. The South China Sea issue has been a focal point for regional tension and frankly speaking has become this diplomatic headache for China and ASEAN countries. Uh, let me bring in uh, Professor Lim there from Singapore. What do you make of the meeting's results on controlling tensions on this matter? Do you think that any concrete uh, significant progress has been made? I think, uh, first of all, uh, it's important to know uh, the uh, purpose of this special meeting. And the purpose of this special meeting is twofold. One is to uh, prepare, uh, discuss about the preparatory work for the 25th uh, anniversary of uh, ASEAN-China dialogue relations and uh, to uh, have uh, some communications over the preparatory stage. The other one is to uh, have a discussion on uh, developments in the South China Sea and most uh, countries, uh, in, uh, all countries involved, uh, believe uh, that peace and stability in the, in the uh, South China Sea region is uh, positive and also uh, good uh, for uh, the region as a whole. So these are the two uh, discussion points, and uh, that was uh, what the purpose of the meeting uh, was for. Let's come back to the issue of South China Sea. Now, many foreign ministers actually pushed for an early adoption of this code of conduct, a legally binding and effective code of conduct. Uh, but the talks has been really slow over the years. Professor Wang, what's the major sticking point here? Well, uh, it's a great uh, uh, improvement from the DOC to uh, COC. Because the C uh, DOC, in many Chinese eyes, you just want to limited uh, to China. It's uh, just a declaration, no legal uh, abandonment. So COC negotiation, most important, uh, I think, uh, uh, obstacle is that it cannot constrain the uh, United States, which is the most powerful nation uh, in this region. Even it's not an uh, uh, Asian country. Uh, so that reason, uh, it's only combined uh, ASEAN countries and China. Uh, but this is uh, maybe a uh, future potential uh, and problem. Professor Hedarian, how powerful will, be, will this code of conduct be? Because the DOC now we have, it's not a legally binding uh, agreement. Uh, it lacks, it only aims to ease tensions, yeah. but not resolving this underlying conflict. It also lacks right. a dispute settlement mechanism. So how influential will, will a code of conduct be on that front? Right. I mean, it has been more than 14 years since the signing of the Declaration and Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea. And there's a sense that non o not only are we lagging 
uh, behind times and developments on the ground in terms of adopting a legally binding code of conduct, but it seems the very spirit of the, code of, of the declaration of the conduct of parties in the South China Sea is not also being respected. I mean, depending on what country you ask, I think all of us agree that certain claimant states are engaging in unilateral actions or are engaging in actions that go against the very spirit of the declaration of conduct of parties in the South China Sea. There's also hope that certain claimant states are resorting to force or threatening the usage of force. So it seems that the DOC himself, itself is not being respected. In my opinion, COC is important in principle, but I think what's more urgent for us to have right now is a total freeze on reclamation activities, not only by China, but also by some ASEAN countries who have been also accused of being engaged in reclamation activities. I think all parties, including China, should refrain from unilateral actions that will uh, jeopardize regional uh, security. And I think it's very important that no country, especially China, will not impose any exclusion zone or air defense identification zone in the area. I think that should be the priority right now. And then in addition to that, I think we also have to find a common stance on how do we make sure that our claims in the area are consistent with prevailing international law, not historical claims that are not backed up by evidence or are not consistent with prevailing international law. I want to give a chance to Professor Wan to uh, make a response to what's just been said. Uh, what do you make of the accusation that has been made toward China's activity in the contested waters? Well, we, all, we know uh, that the Philippines, the suit is case to the arbitration court. Actually, this is not uh, the standing uh, court. It's just uh, because of the, the Philippines unilaterally demand. And then because of the, in this case, Japanese support some uh, judges still are working. And also because of the, the Philippines were, have the political changing. Uh. So this is political game. It's not just the, uh, particularly focus on the stability and peace in the South China Sea. At the same time, the international law, not to tell you which island, I said, belongs to whom. You cannot do this. So the Philippines want to use this unilaterally, want to challenge the Chinese uh, so-called uh, Night Dutch Alliance, and then to in favor of their sovereignty to claim. This is, I think, uh, we should uh, make it clear. Professor Hidarian, a political game, is that what you would, would call it? And what do you make of China's stance that it's uh, saying that Philippines' move actually violates the UN clause and the DOC? Professor Hidarian, yes. you go uh, ahead. I think uh, I encourage our good friends in China to read the press release that came out from the Permanent Court of Arbitration last October which clearly said that, first of all, the Philippines arbitration case does not have to do anything with sovereignty claims. I think uh, your guest from China is absolutely right. UNCLOS does not have a mandate on sovereignty claims. But the Philippines case is not about sovereignty. It's about maritime entitlement claims. It's about the regime of islands and determination of what kind of land features are we fighting over. And it's also about whether countries can exercise their sovereign rights within their exclusive economic zone. And the Philippines has already passed the admissibility and jurisdiction question. So what we are waiting right now is verdict. In my opinion, the thing is this. This arbitration case should not be a basis for greater conflict between Philippines and China. I think it should be a basis for the two countries to move forward. And we know that this arbitration case will not be a game changer. It will be only one step in the direction of resolving these disputes peacefully. But again, as also mentioned a while ago, the Philippines will have a new president. So that also injects some sort of uncertainty and possible changes in how the Philippines approaches the South China Sea. Some uncertainty indeed. And we can see that the sign of Philippine tension continues to amplify ahead of this impending ruling by the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Let me bring in Professor Lim joining us there from Singapore. Well, Singapore is not a claimant of the South China Sea. As an observer, how do you feel this case between uh, China and the Philippines? Well, I think the uh, meeting uh, mentioned three very important points. The first point is that the uh, ASEAN ministers noted uh, the uh, concerns about the developments in the South China Sea. And the second point is that they stress on maintaining peace and stability in South China Sea. And also the uh, um, development uh, to have peace uh, based on legal as well as diplomatic uh, processes. So that was the second point that was discussed. And for the third point that was discussed, it is hope uh, that there can be a peaceful resolution uh, to the disputes. So collectively, uh, both uh, uh, ASEAN and China hopes that these three points can be resolved. These are long-standing issues. They can't be resolved instantly, hopefully with dialogue, hopefully with uh, exchanges and opinions. Uh, such uh, issues can be uh, discussed uh, frankly. And uh, also over time, 
there can be some uh, uh, agreements on certain points uh, related to the issue, like uh, maritime, uh, pres uh, maritime conservation, uh, joint uh, uh, issues about uh, handling uh, uh, maritime uh, cr uh, criminal activities on the sea, and all these are mentioned in the Code of Conduct. So the meeting in, in that way is uh, uh, useful uh, to discuss all these points uh, frankly and to push for the development and implementation of the Code of Conduct with gradual understanding. Okay, uh, we want to also take a look at the economic side, right? I want to read this to our viewers first and to all of you. Uh, China has been the largest trading partner for ASEAN Bloc. In 2016, it's seen China and ASEAN's cooperation entering its 25th year, with increasing trade volume being a major goal for both sides. China is the largest trading partner of ASEAN, as I mentioned, and in 2015, trade volume between China and ASEAN countries reached 472 billion U.S. dollars. An Indonesian official says the two sides plan to raise trade volume to 1 trillion U.S. dollars by the year 2020, but many have worried that the South China Sea disputes would jeopardize the trade relations between China and ASEAN bloc. Professor Wang, are you worried? Of course, some uh, impact, uh, but we cannot exaggerate uh, the influence of that. For instance, the so-called the freedom of navigation, uh, as, uh, commercial meaning, no any problem. Even there are disputes always. Uh. So uh, I think this is mutual benefit is not only to in this region, but also for other stakeholders, including the United States, Europeans. So everybody focus on trade, focus on the stability. There's no problem. Bilateral dispute. As Chinese experience, we have 14 uh, uh, land uh, neighbors, all bilateral negotiate, uh, solve this problem, only remain in the China uh, Indian. Uh, so the territory dispute in the maritime, also I think we can bilateral negotiate to solve this. No one can choose the case and then ask other countries like a uh, superpower to you know, back and then to solve this problem. I don't think this is the way. Uh, I, I think we, the dispute with the Philippines after the, uh, the, the, the government change, I think it will be come down and it is good for ASEAN and good for China-ASEAN relations. Mm -hmm. Professor Hidarian, your thoughts on trade relations between China and ASEAN bloc? Well, right. Right, I think it, when it comes to economics, that's where the picture is brighter and much more hopeful. Uh, despite the increase in tensions in the South China Sea, we see that trade relations between China and much of the ASEAN has been booming. And in le recent years, you see that China is also becoming a much more important player in the infrastructure landscape, also in the last landscape of overall investment in ASEAN. So I think it's important for us to make sure that the South China Sea disputes do not define our overall bilateral relationship and we continue to cooperate in areas where we have common interests. And this is precisely the position that the incoming president of the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte, is taking. In his opinion, it's important to make sure that we put aside the South China Sea disputes and try to deal with them separately from the overall bilateral relationship between Philippines and China. I think Philippines and China is one of the few bilateral relationships in the ASEAN that has actually suffered as a result of the South China Sea dispute. So I think it's really the Philippines and China have, uh, who have to do some improvements and to make sure that the disputes in the South China Sea will not affect their uh, relations negatively. I'm very optimistic that with, with the new president in the Philippines, there will be more emphasis on how we can bring in more Chinese investments into the Philippines in, so that the Philippines could also develop and move to the next stage of economic development. Professor Lim, what do you see the biggest potential on economic side between China and the ASEAN countries? I think there are three very important points uh, here. First of all, ASEAN and China already enjoy uh, good trade uh, relations. There are economic exchanges, as you have mentioned, between ASEAN and China, and China is all, uh, already a top trader, importer, exporter, or investor in some of the uh, ASEAN uh, countries. That's the first point. Second point, on 31st of uh, December 2015, the ASEAN Economic Community was formed, and this allows uh, ASEAN uh, to have the uh, in, uh, ambitions uh, to have a common uh, market and also to have a common economy. And this is where uh, China uh, can come in to have more interactions with the ASEAN economic community. And the third important point is China itself has launched the One Belt, One Road uh, policy and also has started the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB. And therefore, uh, some countries have welcomed and ASEAN on the whole has welcomed China's role in building infrastructure to increase connectivity in the region, whether it's through hardware like uh, railroads or 
uh, through people-to-people -people exchanges, through cultural programs, etc. So based on these three points, uh, the, uh, po there is a positive uh, aspect of ASEAN-China relations. All right, and Professor Wang, Professor Darian, uh, Hidarian just mentioned uh, the bilateral ties between China and the Philippines are actually one that has suffered from the disputes in South China Sea. Uh, but are we going to see a recovery of diplomatic relations sometime between China and the Philippines and also China and Vietnam? Yes, I agree with that uh, panelist uh, that uh, cooperation and uh, trade investment, this is uh, all sides and hope. This is back to the uh, original position of China during the uh, Deng Xiaoping period, uh, uh, initiative that put aside a something dispute that uh, joined to explore in these islands and ISIS. This is a good policy. So and we should continue, our, uh, not let the dispute you know, jeopardize the cooperation and damage the, the trust and even the people's feeling. I think that China and uh, the Philippines and, uh, should have good relations in the future. And you also mentioned uh, the bilateral negotiation between uh, China and claimant countries in the South China Sea. What do you say to critics that question uh, whether China is using its economic leverage, you know, to have a greater say uh, in order to keep negotiation at a bilateral level? But to make it clear, China does apply this dual track system, which also involves a multilateral uh, approach. Uh, again, give the uh, example that is the land dispute uh, when the collapse of the Soviet Union. All these uh, new uh, uh, members, uh, countries, they are smaller com compared to China. But uh, any you know, territory dispute that uh, China used the uh, leverage of the economy to get more, I don't think any uh, uh, like this. So territory dispute should uh, peaceful and equally uh, e uh, negotiate, not in part by the uh, third party and then to jeopardize the regional stability.